All right, so welcome to this demonstration on the very basics of hypothesis testing. And as I've written there, there's gonna be no maths in this demonstration. So you can take a breather. This is just designed to give you the overall concepts and develop your intuition about how hypothesis testing actually works. And to some degree, this is gonna be more important than actually learning all those formula later on. And I'll bet you by the end of all this, you'll have a really good foundation for all of your subsequent work with hypothesis testing. So let's get straight into it. I'm gonna present you with a hypothesis. This is my hypothesis, Justin's hypothesis. The average height of students at university is 175 centimeters. Now let's ignore the potential differences in height between men and women, let's just keep it simple. And yes, while we call this a hypothesis just in normal English, the term hypothesis actually has a specific meaning in statistics as something which we can put to the test. So let's try and do that by taking a sample. Here we've got a sample of 20 students and the average height of these students is 174.6 centimeters. Now I'm gonna ask you, how much doubt do you think this casts on my hypothesis? Now I've said, I think the average height is 175 centimeters We've got a small sample and it appears to be slightly less than that. But does that really cast a lot of doubt on my hypothesis? Probably not, right? I mean, you understand the concept of random variation. And here, we've got a random selection of 20 students and it's possible that they just were slightly less than the true average, which might still be 175 centimeters. So it's not outside of the realms of possibility that my hypothesis is still correct. Now, let me ask you this. Imagine we've taken another sample, or let's just say that turned out differently, and the average height was 168.4 centimeters. So that's now a little bit further away from 175. So how much doubt does this cast on my hypothesis, do you think? This is probably gonna cast more doubt than the last example, because even though we have the same number of people in our sample, their average height is quite a bit lower than 175. So you gotta start thinking, well, how likely is it that the true mean is 175? How likely is it that this sample is just randomly less than the true mean? Believe it or not, you've just done your first hypothesis test. I know we haven't dealt with any formula or numbers yet, but this is just what a hypothesis test is. So to be more specific, we call that original hypothesis, the null hypothesis, and we give that the symbol H subscript zero or H naught. And that null hypothesis was that the true mean was 175. And we've got this other thing called the alternate hypothesis, H1 or HA as it's sometimes written. And under the alternate hypothesis, the true mean is actually not 175. So the question is, is our sample mean far enough away from 175 centimeters for us to be able to reject that original hypothesis. And you've just done that yourself. In that second example there, you thought, mm, maybe it is far enough away from 175. Maybe there is now quite a bit of doubt cast over that null hypothesis. Let's consider this number line, the possible values of X bar. And you can see I've written X bar on the right there. Now that is the symbol we use for the sample mean. Now, if the true population mean was 175 centimeters, if you took a sample, you're still probably expecting that sample mean to be 175 centimeters. But of course, we know that due to random variation, it won't necessarily match up with that exactly. It could be, say, 174, it could be 176. But what a hypothesis test will do will be to set these critical values beyond which we're gonna start saying, you know what? Let's reject that null hypothesis. So when our sample gets too extreme, we start casting a lot of doubt on that null hypothesis. So with our example at 168.4 centimeters, that was our sample mean, that could well be in that rejection region on the left there. So maybe that is too far away from 175. Now let's try another example. Let's say that Louisa has a hypothesis and she says that the average age of postgraduate students at university is 31. Again, how are we gonna test this? Well, we're gonna have to take a sample. And let's say we've taken a sample of only five students this time and we've found that their average age is 34. 
Here's my question again. How much doubt does this cast on Louise's hypothesis? So I hope you're getting the gist now. If it's 34, you might think, mm, even though it's slightly higher than 31, which was Louise's hypothesis, we've only got a sample of five students. And maybe we just selected five that were a little bit older than the average. And if we selected another five, maybe that average age would be a lot lower than that. So you probably think, mm, it doesn't cast that much doubt at this stage. But let me ask you this. Imagine we did the same thing, but took a sample of 200 students and found that the average age was 34. If I asked you again how much doubt this casts on Louise's hypothesis, you're gonna start thinking that, yeah, that is casting a lot of doubt. The average age hasn't changed of our sample, but what has changed is the number of observations in the sample. So we now have 200 students in the sample. So what that means is that we're, we're more confident about the precision of that sample mean. And I think intuitively you can kind of see this work, right? Imagine you had a huge sample and found the average age was 34. You're going to start thinking, well, we've pretty much got almost the entire campus here. The true average age is probably not going to be 31 anymore. So if we just line this up again, our null hypothesis here is that the true population mean was 31. And our alternate hypothesis is that it's not 31. So in our sample of five students, those critical values that we would draw here to determine whether we would reject that null hypothesis might be far away from 31. But when we had 200 people in our sample, those critical values beyond which we're going to reject that null hypothesis are actually quite close to 31 itself. So if we get a sample mean up at say 32 or maybe 33, maybe that's enough evidence here to reject that null hypothesis. Now, I haven't done any actual calculations here yet, but there will be ways for us to calculate those exact regions to determine whether we're going to reject that null hypothesis or not. And that fun is waiting for you in subsequent videos. But the question that we're really asking is this. If the null hypothesis were true, how extreme is our sample? This really is the core question that a hypothesis test tries to answer numerically. And while I've promised you we're not going to get too mathematical, just as a heads up, you'll get a formula that might look a little bit like this. And this Z is a measure of that extremeness. So when Z is close to zero, that means that our sample lines up pretty much with what we would expect if the null hypothesis was true. And if you have a look at the numerator of that function, you can see that if the sample mean equals the hypothesized mean mu, then we're going to get zero. And the larger that gap between x and mu, the larger the z value, meaning our sample is more extreme. And this means we're more likely to reject the null hypothesis. And we saw this happen with Justin's hypothesis at the beginning of this video. And also you might notice on the denominator, there's an n down there. And we now understand how that works too, because as n increases, that value of z will also increase meaning again that we're more likely to reject the null, as we saw in Louisa's example. Now the sigma in that formula represents the underlying standard deviation, but that's at least the formula explained. So just in this very theoretical example we've done, we know that we're more likely to reject H0 when the sample difference is greater, like in Justin's example, and when the number of observations is greater, like Louisa's example. Now this brings us to our final concept, which is type one and type two errors. Now let's go back to the original example where the null hypothesis was that the population mean was 175 centimeters. And we're trying to see if there's enough evidence to reject that. One key principle you have to keep in mind is that we can never disprove that null hypothesis. You're never gonna use the word proof in any of this stuff because even when the true population mean is 175 centimeters, it's still possible to get an extreme sample. So you're never going to disprove it. And thus there's always a possibility of you incorrectly rejecting it. And that's what a type one error is about. So remember this, remember how we had our regions where we were going to reject the null hypothesis. A type one error occurs when you reject a null hypothesis that is in fact true. 
So if our sample mean lay in those rejection regions and we therefore rejected that null hypothesis, it's still possible that that null hypothesis was true, don't forget. We can never remove that probability of a type 1 error. And in fact, we give that a name. The probability of a type 1 error is called the level of significance or alpha. And you can actually choose your level of significance. You can choose how strict you're being with your decision to reject that null hypothesis. And often we're going to use a level of 5%. That's just the convention. But just appreciate that these regions that we've drawn up here where we're going to reject that null hypothesis are completely arbitrary. We've just decided on them based on this level of strictness that we can call the significance level. Now you might be able to guess what a type 2 error is. Here's that rejection region again from that first example. A type 2 error occurs when you do not reject a null hypothesis that is in fact false. So say our sample mean lay very close to 175 and we therefore chose not to reject that null hypothesis. It is of course still possible that the true population mean is different from 175. I mean it could be anything and in that case we'd be committing a type 2 error. And again, this probability of committing a type 2 error is something we can't fully mitigate. There's always going to be a probability of committing a type 2 error when we conduct a hypothesis test. And in this case, the probability of doing so for a type 2 error is called beta. And for your own knowledge, 1 minus beta is called the power of the hypothesis test. So if beta is the probability of a type 2 error, which is not rejecting a null hypothesis that is in fact false, 1 minus beta is the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis that is in fact false, which is what we'd want to do if the null hypothesis was false, right? We'd hope that we would reject it. And the chance of us doing that is the model's power. So that's it. That's my brief introduction to hypothesis testing. And you can continue on to the next video if you'd like, where we start getting down and dirty with the mathematical calculations. But if you've enjoyed this video, feel free to do all that subscribing stuff and let me know if you've got any ideas as well. Feel free to comment on the bottom of this or get in touch.